All right, so this shouldn't take that much longer, actually. Um, we have only about 20 slides left, maybe that. So this picks up chapter 16 where we left off. So we've moved on from the sympathetic nervous system and we are now into the parasympathetic, so our rest and digest division. So this is also called the craniosacral division, which I can now write because my computer's charged up enough. Um, and so, craniosacral. Um, and that's of course because the cell bodies of the preganglionic neurons are located either in the brain stem and associated with spinal nerves, or excuse me, uh, cranial nerves, or in the sacral spine and uh, associated with sacral nerves. Uh, and you can see that there's overlap between vagal innervation and pelvic nerve innervation. So uh, some of those are kind of crossing over. So the ganglia in this case are either called terminal ganglia, where they're near effectors, or intramural ganglia. Uh, intramural means within wall. So that just means they're in, actually inside the tissue of the effector. And that's pretty common uh, if you look closely. So we can see that the terminal ganglia tend to be associated with the brain stem and the spinal nerves. Uh, and then with the exception of the vagus, of course, because that is associated with intramural postganglionic fibers for all of this stuff and this stuff. So oftentimes when you're looking histologically, you can actually see these ganglia if you look closely uh, for them within the walls or tissue of an organ. They just appear as little patches of neural tissue that are amongst the tissues of the organ, uh, very often present in smooth muscle specifically. So one example here, uh, this is a look at an intramural ganglion. And so remember, since these ganglia are ganglia, meaning they're populations of cell bodies, and then very, very short axons leading away from them, uh, they look like this. So these little patches of lighter tissue are intramural ganglia between the muscular layers of the digestive system. So we'll see a lot of those next term too when we do the histology of the digestive tract. So as far as the cranial version of the craniosacral division, we've got uh, fibers that are cranial nerves. So if we look, we can see their arrangement. So innervations of lacrimal glands, pupil, as you can see here. So not the rectus muscles, those are somatic, but the pupil, and then salivary glands and other glands. So these are innervating structures in the head primarily, but also of course via the vagus nerve. Uh, so this is vagus. We've got the ventral cavity as well. But again, the wiring organization of the top four cranial nerves uh, consist of terminal ganglia, whereas the vagus is going to be longer and deliver that intramural innervation. So for the cranial outflow, the effectors are the smooth muscles of the eye. So I mentioned the, excuse me, I wanted to use epic pen for that, not this one. Um, so sphincter pupillae, so it's a sphincter muscle, meaning this is going to constrict the pupil, make it smaller. And what I forgot, regrettably, but I shouldn't have, is the ciliaris muscle. So that's part of the ciliary body of the eye. And this is going to do things like change shape of lens. So it's involved in uh, focusing your eye. The glands are your nasal glands, your lacrimal glands, and your salivary glands. So anything that makes a blood filtrate, uh, primarily serous blood filtrate, like saliva, um, but also with mucus components as well. So nasal and salivary glands also have mucus components. Um, so anything like that is gonna be innervated by the parasympathetic. And then the ventral cavity viscera are on the next slide. So we've got of course, this big long vagus nerve innervating 
all of your ventral cavity viscera and therefore taking up the lion's share of sympathetic outflow, which makes sense, right? Because your thoracic and abdominal viscera are responsible for keeping you alive. Uh, your eyes and salivary glands, still important, not quite as much. I think we can all agree. So, vagal preganglionic fibers, as you can easily see from this diagram, extend almost all the way to their effectors, um, and in many cases end up on a ganglion inside their effectors. So this is going to innervate ventral cavity viscera, except the pelvic organs, which are by the sacral spine. Um, speaking of the sacral spine, this is one of the reasons why a spinal cord injury that is lower can cause one to lose sexual function and control of their bladder, as well as loss of the use of their legs, but the ventral cavity viscera remain more or less undisturbed. So the pelvic nerves are going to be down here, so innervating primarily the reproductive structures and the genitals, as well as the urinary bladder. And these are going to originate from the sacral spine, so between S2 and S4. And remember, by the time we get to the sacral spine, we no longer are in spinal nerve, or excuse me, no, no longer are in spinal cord territory. We are now in cauda equina, that horse tail of spinal nerves that extends past the conus medullaris of the spinal cord, which remember that conus medullaris is the terminal end of the spinal cord, and it actually ends in your lumbar spine. So the pelvic viscera are going to travel out uh, via the ventral root and basically go straight to their effectors. So this is going to continue uninterrupted myelinated axon all the way out to the effector. Oh, and let's not, of course, forget the sphincters. So one problem that paraplegics have, if depending on the severity of their injury uh, and where it's located and what things are damaged, is that uh, due to the denervation, which is the word that means removal of innervation, so the denervation of their uh, rectal, rectum and anal muscles and their urethral sphincters, uh, they often need assistance with uh, expressing their bladder and with defecation. Um, and the same is true for all animals. So like I, you know, once looked after a rescue cat that was partially paralyzed due to being smushed a bit by a car, um, very happy kitty, but needed me to basically squeeze his bladder out because uh, he couldn't do it himself. So special needs kitties, worth it, lots of work. Okay, so parasympathetic sacral outflow. We've got smooth muscle gl and glands of pelvic organs. So the distal colon and the rectum. Um, this is a little bit of a weird illustration choice. So the distal colon is part of the large intestine. So it would be this area, mostly. Um, this is the small intestine, this mass in the middle. Uh, the rectum, the anus, the kidney, the urinary bladder, and the repro organs, and any sphincters associated, so urinary sphincter as well. Hence the problems with uh, expressing waste I just mentioned. And these are going to project to intramural ganglia, so within the walls of the target organ. So the major effects of parasympathetic act activation are going to be pupil constriction, so that opposes the action of the sympathetic nervous system on the pupil, which is to dilate it. So the uh, state of your pupil, if it's like, say, halfway dilated, um, depending on ambient light conditions, is going to be basically a uh, oppositional relationship between the sympathetic nervous system trying to do one thing and the parasympathetic trying to do another thing, and that averages out. In some cases, one or the other takes over. Uh, so this is also your rest and digest division, so it's going to act on the enteric nervous system in the GI tract to upregulate secretions, which is like gastric juice, for example, so the acidic stomach juice or pancreatic juice, which contains enzymes, 
and also motility, which is a way to say uh, muscle action that kind of pushes food through that tract. It's also going to reduce the heart rate and reduce the force of heart contractions. Um, so not only is the heart beating slower, it's not slamming shut very hard. Uh, one of the benefits of this is you only get, unless you're very lucky and unlucky at the same time, one heart per life. That's the base model of human is one, one heart per life. Uh, some people end up getting a second one and rarely a third one, uh, but typically we get one. So what that means is it's important for that one single heart to not be working overdrive all the time because that would reduce its longevity. So uh, having periods of quiescence is important for heart health. Airway constriction. So we don't always want our airway to be maximally open because that's how gunk gets in. And so when we're doing quiet breathing and we're not active and we're not requiring that much oxygen, the airway constricts to provide airflow but limit the intake of particulate matter. Um, as I mentioned in the last PowerPoint, changes in blood flow and glandular secretions during sexual, sexual arousal are uh, mediated by the parasympathetic nervous system. So I mentioned uh, seminal fluid secretion and also uh, vestibular gland secretions in, in females. Um, so these are going to be things that happen during the arousal phase uh, of intercourse and the parasympathetic, or sympathetic, excuse me, takes over uh, during the climax phase and the results of it. So it's like this group effort between parasympathetic and sympathetic activation. Um, the reason I'm being so explicit about that is because A, it's interesting, and B, I'm giving you a preview of uh, some of the first content next term. So in 242, we start with endocrine and reproductive system. Uh, they're related because the gonads are also reproductive or, or, or excuse me, the gonads, which are reproductive organs, are also hormones or hormone secreting organs, endocrine glands. So they kind of overlap, which is why we start with those two things. So you can expect to hear a lot more about how this stuff works next term, as well as this. So 242 is the fun term because we get to talk about reproduction, which is very interesting, and also waste management and harvesting energy from food. Also super interesting. So defecation and urination as well. And this is an interesting thing. So each of your sphincters, your urethral and your anal sphincter, there's an inner one, which is smooth muscle. And there's also an outer one, which is skeletal muscle. So your defecation and uh, micturition reflexes are only partially voluntary. The rest is controlled by your autonomic nervous system. Um, but sometimes it's necessary to help the skeletal muscles of those sphincters relax, the outer sphincters, in order to facilitate it. So the parasympathetic does a little bit of that as well. Okay, so neurotransmitters and parasympathetic function. So we're back to this compare and contrast diagram in which we have sympathetic and parasympathetic side by side. So remember, all preganglionic neurons in the autonomic nervous system, regardless of uh, whether they're sympathetic or parasympathetic, these all release acetylcholine. So here we've got cholinergic and cholinergic, so that's a similarity. And then in this case, the postganglionic fibers are also mostly cholinergic. So we've got all of them cholinergic. So instead of this switch from cholinergic to adrenergic or nitroxidergic here, we have cholinergic all the way down, which makes it a little bit easier. So we've got acetylcholinesterase in the synapses to break down extra acetylcholine and stop a response. And there's also tissue cholinesterase. So if acetylcholine goes a wandering, as it sometimes does, it is broken down and rendered inactive. So the parasympathetic division is still divergent, but it's a lot less divergent than sympathetic pathways. And that's, of course, a difference that's mostly based on the urgency, right? So if we have a system in place to deal with mostly urgent situations, uh, and urgency not only includes emergencies, but also, of course, like if I start running, my heart and my blood flow better keep up, right? So that's not exactly urgent. 
in a emergency sense, it's more urgent in a I'm doing a thing and I need to support that thing by changing my metabolism kind of way. But regardless, if you are doing parasympathetic stuff, there's not quite the speed requirement as there is over on the sympathetic side, and therefore we only need a little bit of divergence. So one preganglionic fiber to about six to eight postganglionic ones versus the up to 25 that the sympathetic nervous system has. Okay, so fortunately, due to learning about the neuromuscular junction, you already are familiar with chemical synapses and with specifically acetylcholine and cholinergic synapses. So we can divide the effect by the receptors involved, and these are either nicotinic or muscarinic. So let's take a brief jog laterally into a little bit of explanation because I'm sure that nicotinic looks familiar to some of you and maybe muscarinic to others of you as well. So kind of like with my explanation of splanchnik, um, it's useful to talk about why those receptors are called those things. So we have, I'm just gonna draw an example. Not that I actually know what this plant looks like, I'm just kind of making an assumption. I don't know if it's a monocot or a dicot, but regardless, there is a leafy plant that is very rich in the substance nicotine, and that is of course a tobacco plant, right? So let me just, I'm drawing myself a crude tobacco plant here. Um, And tobacco has been used by many, many societies and cultures for many years uh, because it is a alterer of physiology and a psychoactive and bioactive substance. So nicotine from tobacco. And so it turns out uh, when the early investigations of these receptors were being discovered and studied, one of the ways that it was discovered was people investigating the effect of nicotine. So like, why does nicotine do the things that it does when you smoke it or consume it? Um, so people were like, well, why? And why is it used by so many cultures? Um, because in moderation, it can promote relaxation and change your physiology a little bit, and that's why people enjoy it. Unfortunately, it's also addictive, and so investigations were being done into why those things were true, and they discovered that the nicotine acts primarily on targets and amplifies parasympathetic type responses in effectors. So it definitely does change our physiology, and that's obvious. If you've ever used nicotine before, it's very clear that it changes your physio physiology based on how you feel. Um, and so they basically discovered nicotinic acetylcholine receptors that way because the nicotine was just going and landing on those acetylcholine receptors. Um, so that's kind of the deal there. And then we have on the muscarinic side, if you're like wondering what I'm drawing, I'm sure it will be clear to you momentarily, but some of you probably already know. So we've got a familiar little mushroom with a white stalk and a red cap and white spots on its fruiting body. And so this mushroom, which is a little toadstool, uh, and it is also sometimes called fly agaric. Regardless, this mushroom produces
muscarine, which is a substance that when being investigated, because this particular mushroom is also widely used culturally, um, it is both psychoactive and alters your physiology in ways that some people find pleasant. Uh, dosage matters, obviously. But regardless, it's a mushroom to be careful with because there is such a thing as too much and uh, it can act on physiology in ways that are very dangerous. And one of the reasons for that is that muscarin was discovered to act on muscarinic acetylcholine receptors and change physiology of parasympathetic responses that way. So we kind of back calculated the function of the receptors by first looking at science for answers to something else. So like, why does nicotine feel the way it does? Why do lots of cultures use it? What's the deal with that? And same deal with muscarin and you know ritual consumption of fungi, for example. Um, and so those were objects of interest, obviously. And so people investigated them and then they were like, oh, this relates to the sympathetic nervous system. And in fact, we're figuring out that it has this overlap with acetylcholine. So that's kind of how that came to be. Which is super interesting. So let's talk about how they're the same and how they're different. So nicotinic receptors are always excitatory and that's because they're the same ones that we've been looking at all term. So in nicotinic receptors, the nicotinic receptor itself is a uh, chemically gated sodium channel. So when acetylcholine binds to it, it opens up and lets sodium in producing a graded potential that is excitatory in nature and can result in an action potential if there's enough exocytosis of acetylcholine. So, um, it's obviously at all neuromuscular junctions for the somatic nervous system because of skeletal muscle, right? And in all autonomic nervous synapses between preganglionic and postganglionic neurons. So there's a lot of these, which explains a lot about why the nicotine substance alters physiology so much. Muscarinic effectors are present on all parasympathetic effectors so there's acetylcholine present and being released by both neurons, but the receptor type differs. Um, so all parasympathetic effectors have muscarinic. So these are the, uh, you know, receptors that are interacting with the postganglionic neuron releasing acetylcholine. And we've got these at neuromuscular or neuroglandular junctions. And these are not ion channels. These are activated with second messenger cascade processes. So acetylcholine would bind to here, or muscarin in some cases, and wake up this little G protein, and then we've got the denylate cyclase again, and then cyclic AMP, and then metabo changes. And one of the reasons that this is beneficial is because as long as cyclic AMP remains elevated within the cell and is not discarded or destroyed, the effects will persist. So that allows for a longer lasting effect. Interestingly, they can be excitatory or inhibitory depending on the cell they are activated in. So yeah, that's what depending on effector means. So autonomic tone, so we talked about tone in the muscular system. Tone means a resting state of partial contraction for a muscle, um, and it means in the nervous system, a resting level of spontaneous activity of ANS neurons. So I talked a little bit about this in pathways when I talked about uh, Parkinson's pathology, um, but it's bear it bears mentioning here too. So we think of neurons as only being activated by a graded potential of some kind, but that's not really true. Um, they're activated systematically and with a specific goal by graded potentials that are, you know, forming for a specific reason, but all neurons in general have a resting state of just depolarizing spontaneously for no other reason than that 
they're con they're affected by ambient conditions. So they'll they'll fire off action potentials for like kind of no reason. Um, it's just a reality of neurons, and n almost you know all neurons studied have some rate of spontaneous depolarization. It's kind of a consequence of being semi-permeable and being in a salty solution that sometimes the salts are going to accidentally tip the scales towards producing an action potential. And I want to stress that this is both sympathetic and parasympathetic neurons, not either. Um, so it's the balance of both divisions that determine its effects. So remember I talked about the pupil and the muscle of the iris that controls the diameter of the pupil. We've got the constrictor pupillae in the sympathetic nerve, or excuse me, in the parasympathetic nervous system, and the pupillary dilator in the sympathetic. And so those two muscles obviously have antagonistic actions. So depending on the tone in each of those muscles, as a result of autonomic tone, that's going to be what sets your pupillary diameter based on the contraction of those muscles or lack thereof. Um, other ones are subtle changes in heart rate that are a result of small adjustments. So for example, if I was sitting here quietly, not speaking, my heart rate would be a little lower, but because I'm breathing intentionally and modulating my breath to produce speech, that's going to change my oxygen levels and change my activity levels as well, and I'm going to see a small increase in heart rate for that. And then if I were to shut up again, I would see it decrease. So crises, which is like, oh no. So alarm phase kind of stuff, like you were startled, you had a near miss in your car, there was a bad accident, something bad happened to you. These result in suppression of the parasympathetic nervous system and stimulation of the sympathetic. So it's not like one turns completely off or one takes over, it's that this one is downregulated while this one is upregulated and that produces the predictable alarm phase responses that we're familiar with. And which suck, not fun. Obviously, you know, being frightened or angry or very upset, not a good time. And so those body feelings that are associated with that uh, are also, you know, our brains associate those body sensations with bad thing is happening. So one problem with uh, anxiety disorders is that the anxiety disorder activates those uh, sympathetic nervous system responses, so your sympathetic tone is higher, and then that kind of becomes self-feedback loopy because it may very well be that you, ha you don't have a quote-unquote good reason for being anxious, like nothing bad is happening, but your body is telling you differently, and so your mind is going to be like, well, something bad must be happening because the, the emergency thing is turned on. So like, obviously I have to be worried about, I don't know, something. Um, and that results in ambient and directionless anxiety, which is really difficult to self-regulate. Um, so beta blockers are one way you can do this. And also doing things like mindfulness, meditation, uh, focusing on your breathing and breathing exercises, anything that you can do to kind of stimulate your parasympathetic nervous system and cause your sympathetic to calm the F down is going to be ultimately beneficial. So I know that many of my students and many students in general suffer from test anxiety. Uh, it is an unfortunate uh, outcome of what we call summative assessments, which is you learned a bunch of stuff, now show me that you know it, instead of learning on the way stuff. Um, and because of that and the urgency and the timedness, it can get people into an anxiety spiral really easily. And anxiety does not produce good cognition, unfortunately. So people make bad choices on tests because they're anxious and that anxiety is self-reinforcing. So what I recommend to my students and to anybody else who might be watching this video is you're going to want to go into a test having a toolbox. So have a procedure that you go through step by step if you run into a question that you don't know the answer to and that causes your anxiety to spike. So that's your cognitive toolbox. If you have a set of steps to focus on, you're going to feel less anxious because you're like, no, I just do the steps and then that gets me to the right answer probably. And you're also going to want to take a minute to check in with your body and notice if you're hunching and if your breathing has increased and 
relax and drop your shoulders and take some deep, even breaths to try and remind your parasympathetic nervous system that it's in charge, not your sympathetic one. So coming prepared to testing situations with that sort of arsenal of tools and knowing that you can deploy the tools if you need them, that itself helps cut down on test anxiety significantly. So it's not only one thing or the other, it's both and just the mere fact of preparedness helps too. So I strongly recommend that you do that. Um, and also I think I'm gonna make a video just about uh, test taking skills in general because I know that some students come into A&P with ingrained habits from like high school, for example, uh, that aren't healthy or useful in college and also just tips and tricks to be a better test taker because there is some element of, of assessment that is just not so much are you good at the material, but how good are you at taking tests? And I can help you with that too. Okay, so visceral reflexes. Remember, this is just a reminder. Uh, we've got long and short reflexes. So the long reflex is going to include afferent information being coordinated by interneurons in the spinal cord, and then some output is computed, and then there's another synapse after that. Short reflexes don't include the spinal cord step and can be coordinated directly. So we've got afferent sensory fibers, there's a coordinating interneuron in the ganglion, and then there's the peripheral effector. So if you're having a hard time conceiving about how this, like what this might look like, a good example is stretch. So one of the ways your gut moves your food along is that when a, a piece of, a chunk of food that you've chewed up called a bolus, when it enters, your small intestines, it stretches the walls of the small intestine. So when the small intestine walls experience a sensory signal of, hey, something is inside of this lumen, and therefore that's not how you spell stretch <laughs> at all. My brain is tired. It's been a hard week. Um, there we go. That makes more sense. So, and now I'm looking at it and it doesn't look like it's spelled right, even though I know it is. I'm sure we've all been there. When you're like, does weird have IE or ER? EI? Those kind of moments. I have them too, and I'm a professor, so if you have them, don't punish yourself for it. So I think that's how we spell stretch. My brain is not cooperating with me on that, but we're just going to go with it. So stretch receptors are going to send sensory information just right up the short reflex arc. That's going to be coordinated and noticed by the autonomic ganglion, uh, and the parasympathetic is going to be the stretch one involved. And then the ganglionic neuron is going to tell the peripheral effector. So in the case of this example, smooth muscle in wall of small intestine. Uh, hey, stretch is happening, which means that you need to do peristalsis, which is squeezing the food along the tube. So in response to a signal, we don't even need to be coordinated by the uh, central nervous system, we can just say like, oh, well, if it's being stretched, that must mean there's food in there and we have to move that along. So we're just going to go ahead and do that. So that should help you make more sense of those short reflexes and what they're there for. Uh, so these are just interesting features of the ANS that we're not going to discuss or test on, but connecting memory and states of consciousness to the autonomic nervous system helps to put the pieces together for like why, for example, stressful memories, times when you were afraid or sad or angry, things that made you really upset and put you into a state of sympathetic arousal, um, stressors tend to be remembered and consolidated more readily than non-stressors and memory of those stressors can re-ignite stress response predictably. So if you're really scared of something one time and you remember that, you're probably going to experience a reaction to that memory as well as you did to the initial thing that upset or scared you. Um, and also states of consciousness, so sleep-wake cycles, for example, um, the role of those things and how, you know, the autonomic nervous system affects sleep and wake cycles 
in general. So all kinds of interesting stuff there. Um, I think the stress and memory thing is probably the most interesting part because it explains or helps to explain things like post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, anxiety disorders, and their link to, nope, dang, memory. I have to keep making videos, but my ability to spell is tanking. I think I should drink some juice or something. Okay, so if you're interested in those and those things affect your life or the lives of your family members, it might be a good idea to read these. It's not that long, it's only three pages, just so that you can better understand that stuff. Because um, it's a part of life and being better informed about it can help you regulate your own emotions and also help people when they're suffering. Okay, so let's talk about sleep. Sleep is weird. It's a state of dormancy that is meant to give you a reset for a variety of reasons, but it also has stages, as we all know. So most people are kind of familiar because they probably heard rapid eye movement sleep. Um, this is when you dream as well. And then non-rapid eye movement sleep, which is stages down to deep sleep, and then before REM. So there's this cycle uh, that has to happen. So let's look at that cycle next. Um, I just talked about this recently with one of my students, hi Eduardo, uh, who was describing to me one of their friends who is a medical student and sometimes only sleeps two hours a night and you know studies all night and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I mentioned that one way that memory is moved from short-term storage into long-term storage by the hippocampus is that you need to go through these sleep cycles because one of the things that happens during sleep time is your hippocampus is busy sorting things that need to go into long-term or things that can be forgotten. So this is why, for example, although I can remember important events of long ago, I'd be hard pressed to tell you exactly what date or time they took place uh, because I, I don't need to be storing extra data in my limited storage capacity. So sleeping is important for lots of reasons, but one of them that's relevant to students in particular is you got to go through REM cycles to move stuff into long-term memory so that you can do good on tests. So if you come to a, a situation where you're like feeling like you want to stay all night, up all night studying, if you've adequately prepared before that, there is no sense in missing out on sleep the night before a test just to cram additional stuff in. And you're going to be tired and that affects test performance. So like, please, please, please do not pull all-nighter cram sessions. They're not doing you the good that you think they're doing. They're actually deleterious to learning in the long term. Um, and it's, it's just not worth it. So start preparing earlier. Do it in short bursts. Protect your sleep. Make sure that you can sleep deeply and well as much as you can because that's one of the key pieces of health that you need as a student. So what you can see is over about eight hours of sleep, you have one, two, three, four, five instances of drops into very deep sleep and slow wave sleep. And then you ascend into REM, which looks a lot like being awake, but isn't being awake. And although the depth of your sleep gets shallower, the REM cycles increase in length. So now we have long REM. So this is why, for example, if you briefly wake up and then fall back to sleep and enter REM, right before you wake up, you tend to have what feel like very, very long dreams. And they're also very detailed dreams. Um, some of us are lucky and remember our dreams, some of us not so much. I am a dream rememberer. Um, and I remember almost all of my dreams in vivid detail uh, for whatever reason, probably partially because my ADHD makes me wake up a lot at, at night. One of the symptoms of ADHD is uh, you have disordered sleep-wake cycles where your brain thinks it needs to arouse itself at weird times. Um, stupid brain, stop doing that. But cool outcome of that, I guess, is that I get I have this like dream superpower, um, which is neat because, well, sometimes it's neat, sometimes it's not so neat. Sometimes I'm like, brain, what the hell? 
why are, what, what what was that all about um but dreams are really just your brain kind of trying stuff out so i forgive it but sometimes i dream really weird stuff and i'm like what's wrong with you man um so that's kind of the deal there so let's look at the stages individually so when we're tired and we begin to doze that's between one and seven minutes you are beginning to relax you have fleeting thoughts you're easy to wake up but you're descending into a state of dormancy uh, this can be also the most pleasant phase of sleep especially if you're really tired that feeling of like you're finally in bed and you're going to sleep and you're dozing off and you're all cozy oh that's the best um, and that's associated with stage one the next 15 minutes you come more difficult to arouse at about 20 minutes in you get deep sleep this is why if you choose to take a nap um, it really should be at least 20 minutes so taking a 10 minute nap is like not going to do you a whole lot of good um, and then by stage four the deepest levels of sleep when your brain waves are really slow uh, usually this is about an hour but you know not for everybody So REM sleep comes after that, but REM is weird. So it resembles waveform wise being awake, but it actually exceeds that of awake brain function. And one of the reasons for that, like I said, is memory and information sorting and from dreams, brain trying stuff out. So if you think about the dreams you've had that you remembered, a lot of them are probably like kind of what if scenarios where you were in a situation and your brain was like, what if these combination of events happened and in this situation, just to see, you know, cause it's bored, cause it wants to test to see if information goes together. Um, and so, you know, that can manifest in all kinds of different things, including fantastical scenarios. Like recently I had a dream where I, married a rattlesnake um and in doing so i broke up that rattlesnake's relationship with his rattlesnake girlfriend and i was really happy to be married to a rattlesnake and he was a really nice rattlesnake um and we were pals and i don't know what that was about but what i think was happening was my brain just being like hey you like snakes and you like rattlesnakes what if you loved them what if you married one you like it so much you should get married that's what, basically what my brain was doing which is hilarious uh so there's two things going on in addition to a bunch of other stuff and that's kind of what is weird and cool about REM sleep so corresponding to this eye movement increases because you are perceiving imaginary stimuli and that causes your eyes to rapidly move around when dreams occur Skeletal muscles, let's go back, should be inhibited. There's an asterisk there. And what I mean by that is your reticular formation, which is a big player in sleep and wake cycles. Um, one of the things that it does is prevent you from acting out your dreams in real life by inhibiting your skeletal muscles. But we all know that some people sleepwalk and sleep other stuff. Sleep eating is a thing. Unfortunately, sleep driving is a thing. Um, it seems to be just like a weird, you know, neurological malfunction slash uniqueness for people that suffer from it. Um, but in this case, the skeletal muscles are not inhibited and that causes uh, nocturnal somnolent actions for which the person isn't really responsible but it does put them in danger so that's why i say should be um, also when they are inhibited and if you're having a dream that you're aware of or you know awake in the dream for so one that you remember and you're like i remember all the stuff in that dream um, that gives you the feeling of heavy difficult to move arms and legs so like in my dream situation if i need to like fight off something that's like threatening me like punch it 
I'll find that like I feel like I'm punching through water or jello like I can't punch hard enough um, or if I'm running or trying to walk I'm like dang this is really difficult it's because I'm getting biofeedback from my proprioceptors that I'm like trying to do a thing and the it's not happening um, so the proprioceptive portion is activated and I feel that in the dream and it is perceived in dreamland as like why can't I move my legs good so if that's ever happened to you and you're like dang why is that that's why So your autonomic nervous system increases during REM sleep. So interestingly, for most of deep sleep, uh, your parasympathetic nervous system is going to slow and slow down your heart rate, slow down your respiratory rate, decrease your blood pressure, and uh, basically redistribute blood flow in a more parasympathetic manner. But during REM sleep, uh, the activity shifts over to more sympathetic stuff. Um, so this can manifest as like, I'm having a scary dream, or it can just manifest as other things. Interestingly, uh, penile erections that are nocturnal and due to sleeping are actually due to autonomic nervous system activity, specifically sympathetic nervous system activity, because the uh, the way that erections work, just Cliff's Notes version, is troxidergic, ganglionic fibers release NO, nitric oxide, and that's going to dilate the arteries that lead to the erectile tissues and fill the penis up with blood. Um, so it's not sexual. In nature actually it's just your sympathetic tone increases and there are some normal biological consequences of that including nitroxidergic dilation of arteries leading to the erectile tissues of the penis so the reason this is important or interesting is that it allows uh, a distinction to see if the source of erectile dysfunction so failure to either get or maintain an erection is psychological so performance anxiety based, or if it's physiological. And this part is important. So we'll talk more about um, the relationship between male health and what it indicates. But it's actually true that the ability to achieve and maintain an erection can be an important warning sign if it changes suddenly that something is very wrong. And so those things always need to be reported and paid attention to. So in some cases, for example, it can indicate neuro problems, or it can be an early warning sign of untreated diabetes. So this is why if you are a person that has a penis and you start noticing issues of this nature where you didn't have them before, it would be a good idea to have a physical and maybe see a urologist to make sure that it's not something else. Um, I actually listened to a podcast uh, not long ago where a lady told a story about the passing of her husband and how hard that was for her and it turned out the early warning sign that both of them missed was a change in erectile function and then afterwards unfortunately after his death uh, some physicians shared with her that probably what that was was the onset of the diabetes but because they didn't know that they didn't consider it a physiological issue so get yourself checked out better to have a little bit of anxiety or embarrassment than it is to die of something you could have prevented because you missed the signs. Okay, so REM sleep. You have between three and five episodes for eight hours of sleep, and as you'll notice, they get progressively longer, as I mentioned previously. So REM sleep is also important because brain tries stuff out, brain moves memories around, um, but it's so it's necessary for being well rested so the the feeling of being well rested like waking up refreshed and not being like ugh i don't want to be awake i want to go back to sleep and also good decision making and other cognitive functions so again this is me a professor telling you do not stay all, up all night cramming go to sleep it's important so 
arousal in the reticular activating system, so things like what accounts for getting tired or sleepy, and that involves uh, the reticular formation and also, interestingly, brain levels of adenosine. So one of the reasons that caffeine is a stimulant is because it acts on aden adenosine levels in the brain to favor adenosine levels that resemble wakefulness. Uh, also neurotransmitters, drugs, and behavior, and the effect of aging on the nervous system, specifically on sleep and stuff. Um, so you might notice, if you think about the old people in your life that you know, they tend to go to bed and get up really early. And even as I'm aging, so I'm in my early 30s now, um, I notice myself spontaneously waking up earlier and earlier, where I never would have done that in my 20s. I would have stayed asleep all day if I could, but not now. Now my brain is like, hey, it's 4.30, time to get up. And I'm like, stop. So um, those are natural changes that are associated with aging. Happens to everybody. So you can go read about those if you want. And that's the end of the PowerPoint, but before I go, I want to explain one more thing about why it's important to get good sleep. Um, and so let me just really quickly draw something out for you. So let's say we have two cortical neurons. I'm going to make the fun multipolar guys with crazy dendrites. Um, and these are in your, let's say your front, your prefrontal cortex, so the place where all your decision-making stuff happens, uh, cognition, your consciousness, your, you know, identity, those sorts of things that are important. Um, and these two neurons need to talk to each other. Make that a little bit farther away. And so because, of course, the synapses in the brain are chemical synapses, they're going to do so via a synaptic cleft. Sorry, I'm making the axon more regular. It's going to just go over there and do something else. We don't know what. It doesn't matter for this example. And then let's say for the sake of argument also that we have a regulatory neuron that's going to basically that just control the conversation between the initial two neurons. So remember, if you're you know confused about this, go back to the uh, section of the nervous system con content. Oops, sorry, it went vertical for a second. Uh, that concerns presynaptic inhibition and facilitation, um, which basically controls how often this neuron can release neurotransmitter via exocytosis. So the reason that I'm talking about this in relation to sleep is because when there's a lot of activity during the day, when you're awake, because you're really using your prefrontal cortex hard, I'm just going to represent activity as being orange wavies. We have exocytosis of neurotransmitter happening a lot. And that's going to result in waste products. So if you're busy releasing and then degrading and then reabsorbing neurotransmitter all day a lot very much due to lots of neural action potentials happening in the cortex because you're doing thinky stuff, um, what's going to end up happening is the consequence of that is just basically waste builds up. So products of metabolism, uh, urea, which is a product of protein catabolism, which all neurons do and all cells do as well. And we also have neurotransmitter metabolites. So the enzymes that clean up extra neurotransmitter don't do their job perfectly. Um, especially if the activity is high, so we've just got, we're going to have like little bits and bobs of neurotransmitter waste floating around and other cell wastes um, of many varieties. And what happens is these are going to sort of get in the way of synaptic transmission and also potentially build up, and urea especially, 
because nitro nitrogenous waste products are pretty toxic. Uh, urea is not as bad as ammonia, but it's still not great. Uh, if these things build up in your nervous system, they're going to hurt your neurons and impair your function. And then, of course, if you have stuff in the way of a chemical synapse, that reduces synaptic transmission. So that's a problem with wakefulness is that junk accumulates. And we've known for a long time that oops, uh, if you keep someone awake and you give them food and water and everything, you just don't let them sleep. Uh, after too long of that, they tend to just drop dead, which is bizarre because theoretically all of their other physiological needs are met. So why would you just go ahead and die from that? Well, one of the reasons is that during sleep, no, okay, well, I guess we'll just do there, that. Um, during sleep, we have an upregulation of cerebrospinal fluid flow. So it's like turning on a faucet. So the rate of production of CSF at the choroid plexus goes up and the rate of reabsorption at the arachnoid granulations also goes up. So it's like turning up a faucet so that the flow rate is greater. And that's gonna cause the cerebrospinal fluid to have a chance to circulate between all these synapses and with it, carry the wastes away. the dural sinuses and therefore out. So you don't get that CSF flow if you don't have quality sleep and that's why if you don't get good quality sleep or enough sleep you feel groggy and your cognition is impaired and you don't make good decisions and you don't think very well because there is leftover garbage between your neurons and it's impairing your cognitive function. So um, that's why you die, because as the junk builds up over time in someone who's prevented from sleeping uh, and doesn't get flushed away, it starts to impair synaptic transmission of important homeostasis functions, which is not good. Um, but the first thing it does is impair cognition and then later it makes you go nuts and then you die. So that's obviously not a problem that any of us are probably going to face, but getting crappy sleep sure is. And so this is, you know, my message from me to you. Uh, try to have good sleep hygiene. Keep screens out of your bedroom, if at all possible. Make it a place only for sleeping. Uh, keep it cooler um, because body temperature drops during sleep. Get a, get a white noise machine. It's a game changer. And a weighted blanket really helps too. And then just make sure that, you know, you're reducing anything that might wake you up so you can get good quality sleep because that's how you can be the best learner you can be. All right. So, and if anybody is like, no, you're such a fuddy-duddy for going to bed early instead of going to the club or the bar or whatever, just be like, my professor said I have to, and she also said that you're wrong. So you can blame me. I'll be the bad guy. You can just be like, yeah, I don't know. I was, she makes the rules. So I will happily be your excuse if you need to nap or sleep. All right, so that concludes autonomic nervous system, and the next video I'm going to record will be eye and ear, and then that will actually... Uh, complete the material for 241. Finally, I've made a lot of video this term and I'm looking forward to having a catalog finished and complete. So I will see you guys in the next video and which is the final lecture video. Yay. All right. Bye.